Uh, anyway, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3 today. We're going to hang out in verse 1 through 7 uh, for the most part. But if this is the first time or first time in a little while, we are picking up in a series we've been calling Resilient Hope. It is a walk through 1 Peter, Peter's letter to the first century church scattered around modern day Turkey. But it is all about resilient hope, how to grab hold of that kind of a hope, how to then live with a hope in an incredibly antagonistic world. We've been talking about it in the context of a post-Christian world in which we are living here today. And so Peter is writing specifically to a pre-Christian world where the gospel is just beginning to come on the scene. There's a lot of antagonism in the Roman Empire. There's legitimate persecution beginning to happen in his day. It's about to get really heightened in the years to come uh, and and turn very, very violent and things like that. And so he's dealing with a very much a a pre-Christian world. And many of us, or actually all of us, are living in a post-Christian world Uh, where many of us are now starting to feel the sting of what it means to be strangers in this world that does not really affirm or value or hold to many of the beliefs, convictions, and values that we do. And so again, this is a big part of what we're talking about here. And the question of this series essentially is, what is the way of Christ? What does it look like to follow Christ and to live with this kind of a hope in that type of a world? What does it look like to grab hold of this hope in an antagonistic world that is not celebrating the things that you celebrate and is, in fact, antagonistic to some of the things that you may believe? What does it look like? How do you live with that hope uh, in a world that is not as comfortable as it used to be? And so this is what Peter's dealing with here uh, in this letter. And so we've already talked about a number of things. We've talked about five of them so far. I'm going to get a little audience participation and feedback uh, real quick so that we remember them. Number one, we talked about what? Fix your... Hope, that's right. Fix your hope. Don't assume that it's always on genius. Jesus, just because you're in a church, you call yourself Christian. Uh, don't let it subtly slip into other good things, like your hope is actually in a parent, a hero of the faith, a pastor, a podcaster, a church, or other good things that are not created to carry that kind of a hope. Make sure that it's firmly fixed on Jesus, because he's the only one that can sustain that hope and can follow through on what you're hoping him for him to do. So that's number one. Number two is what? Be holy. Say that again. Be, there it is. Be holy. Be holy. Uh, And so that's, yeah, be holy. Have conviction. Live with conviction. Know what's right and wrong. Know what God calls holy. Know what he calls unholy. Live with conviction, but continue to be holy as you engage with the people that do not define or see holy in the exact same way. And so we talked about that quite a bit. Number three was what? Love one another. Love, and we talked about the difference between Philadelphia and love, brotherly love. That's a city of brotherly love. There's a a love that's easy that is, uh, hey, uh, we are like each other. We look like each other, talk like each other. We like the same teams and all these things. He says, go beyond that to an agape kind of a love. This is this unconditional, deep and all satisfying, um, incredible type of love uh, that's saying, hey, I'm not just loving people that I'm like, but I'm going to be loving people that I'm unlike too. And this is where he goes, love one another, not just your friends, but also your your enemies. Number four was what? Grow up in the faith. Don't peek at baptism, right? Don't let your early childhood or the early days that you profess faith be the height of your maturity, but continue to grow in the maturity. Don't stop when you're 50. Don't stop when you're 70. Don't stop until you're dead. Growing in the maturity, putting off sin and walking in the newness of life, which we just celebrated here through that baptism. And so last week we got into number five, And you guys remember what that one was? Do good. Do good. (laughs) I love the way it's like, do good, y'all. Do good. And uh, just do good. And so this is where it gets really tough because he uses one of the more triggering words we could possibly be talking about today, the S word in submission. And he applies it to three really difficult contexts. Government, work, meaning a master-slave relationship is what he's talking about there in that text, and marriage, specifically What does it look like to submit? What does it look like um, to submit in a relationship where you're married to an unbeliever is the immediate context that he's talking about right here. Or you're dealing with somebody who may be far from God, rebelling against God. You're not confident in that person or that spouse to be hearing well the things of God or always doing things that are always for your good or anything like that. And so unbelievably difficult context that we're talking about here uh, in this section of Scripture. Nevertheless, Uh, We continue to preach from the Word of God, and so we let Him dictate what we talk about and things like that. And it's important to recognize that in any of these situations and scenarios, we are not talking about affirmations of the scenario. 
and that is worth repeating because it is, overly, it is incredibly misunderstood outside of the walls. Typically, we're not talking about affirming unjust governments, master-slave relationships, or difficult marriage relationships or anything like that. Moses is unbelievably clear. He says, anyone who kidnaps another for sale must be put to death. In other words, slavery is not is not, is not ever affirmed in Scripture. He is not unclear about the evils of any of these kinds of things. Paul continues, and he rails against things like anger and violence and jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, division. He's talking about the most minor divisions there are, much less massive prejudices and things like that that divide humanity. And he says, I warn you that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so right up front, as we get into what is going to be a different difficult text for us to wrestle with and to talk about some of these words in. We have to know that none of what we're talking about today is calling people to submit to abusive environments, abusive husbands, submitting into sin, or any of these kinds of things. Like we talked about last week how we always are people that submit to God first. He is our always, always, always our first and foremost authority. We submit to him before we submit to anybody else in any context whatsoever. We do not follow anyone into sinful situations or life-threatening situations where your safety or the safety of your kids are ever on the line. The psalmist is unbelievably clear about this. He says, God is our refuge and our strength, church. That's who our God is. He is our refuge and our strength. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. In other words, it is in his character and DNA to be a rescuer out of these types of environments. He's the God who called Egypt out of the bondage of slavery. He is a rescuer and an ever-present help in the times of trouble. And so he is not calling you to continue to remain in and to keep laying down into abusive environments. And people always ask me, Aaron, why do you always give these kind of qualifications and messages like this? And the reason we can continue to do that over and over again is because I'm looking at your faces. And I know the stories. I get the emails. We sit and we have the conversations. We know the difficulties. We know the ways that messages like submission and things like that come out, and we know the ways that it is unjustly applied in the context of homes and meant to be, it, it kind of comes out in these, these situations where it's like, hey, I, the, like the husband has all this authoritative right to go and do whatever he wants to do, and you just got to deal with it kind of a thing. Women come or, and they're asking all the time, why in the world would I want to be in a marriage like that where I'm immediately demoted? Like, why in the world would I want to be in any kind of a relationship where I have no value, I have no voice, I have no contribution, and I just lay down, and if he wants to do whatever he wants to do to me, then I've just got to sit there and submit. And the truth of the, like, this is everyone's stories, y'all. And so we have to understand what we're talking about with an incredible respect and appreciation for what is happening in the real world, and then how the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ completely undermines the horrific ways that this often gets abused. And so we gotta, that's not what we're talking about. As we talk about these words, we're not talking about continuing to submit into those types of environments. Nevertheless, what he is talking about here is unbelievably difficult. It's the question of what do you do when you're married to an unbelieving husband? And you're not on the same page. And you're not valuing the same things going the exact same direction. What do you do when... Maybe you are a believer, and that's not specifically what he's talking about here. But, hey, like you're the one pursuing Christ, and guess what? He's unbelievably apathetic. And you don't have a whole lot of confidence that he's actually hearing from the Lord or anything like that. Like Beyond that, what kind of a marriage has the capacity to win a watching world? Which is specifically what Peter's talking about here in this text. Like Holistically, not just wives, but husbands too. What kind of a marriage has the capacity to win a watching world? And so this is what Peter's getting to next in this text. And so, again, here's a little of what he's talked about. I wanted to bring it into context in the whole. But he's already said in verse 13, chapter 2, Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake to every human authority. Emperors, governors, doesn't really matter. We yield and we defer to anyone who is in governing authority over us. Here's why, verse 15. It is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. It is God's will that by doing good, do good, y'all, do good, Right? It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. I love how Kat said it yesterday. We were working through the text, and uh, she was helping me with a lot of uh, just some of the nuances and everything like this. But she, I love the way that she said it. She said, when leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. Like, when leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. This is what Peter's saying right here. When leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. 
Uh, this is how you silence a fool. It's not by fighting evil with evil. It's not by fighting force with force or anything like that. He says, show proper respect to everyone, verse 17. Show proper respect to everyone. In other words, honor everyone. No matter the situation, be honorable, loving the family of believers, fearing God, and honoring the emperor. This is how you silence a fool. This is how a fool gets one. And so he continues in 18, he says, slaves, do the same thing. In reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to masters, and not only to those who are good, but also to those who are harsh. Again, when leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. When leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. And here's the other reason that he says that. He says, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. When he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. In other words, like when people were hurling insults against him, when people were doing him wrong, he didn't retaliate. When they hurled their insults at him, verse 23, he just said that. He didn't retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, it says that he entrusted himself to him who always judges justly. I love the language there in verse 23. He entrusted himself to him who always judges justly. Instead, and so what Peter's saying is this isn't just what Jesus would do. This is what he actually did. This is what he actually did when he was in the exact same situation. He did not fight aggression with aggression. Instead, he was patient. He chose not to retaliate when he suffered for doing no wrong. When the Romans came to take him away, what did he do? He submitted. He submitted to them. He entrusted himself to the one who always judges justly. When he was a kid, he submitted to his parents and to earthly teachers and things like that. When he's the one who created them, like he submitted to his heavenly father. Like when he was co-equal with the Father, when he was out there teaching the crowds, he said things like, the last will be first, the first will be last. He who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who exalts himself, they're going to be humbled. And so what Peter's saying is here, he's going, hey, church, I don't forget that this is the king that we follow. Don't forget that in the difficult situations that we find ourselves in, that we don't stop following Christ and do what seems right in our own minds or in our own hearts. We don't rise up. We don't do these different kinds of things. Don't forget that this is the king that we follow. Like we follow a king who openly embraced the idea of submission. He didn't run from it. He wasn't offended by it or anything like that. No, no, no. He dealt with it. He lived it. He showed it. He expressed it. He openly embraced submission. We follow a king who chose to lower himself, to condescend from heaven to take on flesh, to be born of a virgin into poverty, and to continue submitting to very imperfect teachers, very imperfect parents, all the way to a cross full of suffering and shame at the hands of the people that he created. And so church, this should blow our mind, the amount that our God and our King submitted himself not only to the Father whom he was co-equal with, but to the people that he also had a hand in creating. Like This should absolutely blow our mind. Because what he's showing us about submission is that it's, it has nothing to do with your dignity, it has nothing to do with your value being diminished, it has nothing to do with your ability to do something better than another person, right? It has nothing to do with any of these things because in every single situation, Jesus was either completely equal with the Father or he had, absolutely, he had absolute power and authority over the people that he chose to submit to. And so we're not talking about things like submitting in a cage fight or something like that, where your goal is to choke the other person out and to force them into submission. That is not the picture of how we see it play out and how Jesus defines it right here. All we see from him is a voluntary decision that is always come from, coming from a place of strength and equality to yield in deference to another, to give himself over to another person for their good. It is a conscious decision to say, I'm not going to retaliate no matter what's coming my way. No matter what's coming over here, no matter what I'm feeling, no matter what's happening, not in the home, in government, in work, whatever the situation may be, I'm not going to retaliate in that way. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. And so here's what he says in relationship to families and marriages specifically. He says, wives, in the same way, meaning in the same way that Jesus did, he says, submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them don't believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty shouldn't come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. We'll talk about that one a little bit. For this is the way that the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah did when she obeyed 
Abraham and called him her Lord. That's a really jarring one, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever tried to say, hey, let's try the Lord title at the home or something. It doesn't really work out well. Um, it doesn't trans transfer well today, um, ever, <laughs> unless you really love your guest bedroom. Um, But he says, you are her daughters if you do what is right and don't give way to fear. Man. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as a weaker partner and as heirs with you, as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. It's tough because we know how easy it is to get wrong. You hear words and we know what our sinful hearts can do with it. I was reminded of a conversation I had with a friend of ours. She's a missionary in Afghanistan, unbelievably gifted, smart, un just awesome, awesome girl. She and her husband were serving in Afghanistan as missionaries, and she was talking about one of the ways that it gets applied in Afghanistan, if you can imagine. But she says, I'm walking down the streets in Afghanistan, and I'm not even legally allowed to look another man in the eyes. If I look him in the eyes, I could be thrown in prison, or he has the right to do with me what he wants to do. She talked about how there's buildings and restaurants and different things, businesses, that she's not allowed to walk in unless she's completely covered head to toe. And if she then walks in, only eyes showing in the presence of a man, she needs to immediately divert her gaze and stare down at the ground. Again, otherwise, he has the right to do with her whatever he wants to do. She tells the story of a friend of hers who was sexually assaulted by a man in the community, and she's the one who went to prison for the crime of adultery while he went free. And granted, like, these are the evil extremes. This is not the normative here in America or anything um, like that, but we know how easy it is to go wrong on this. In fact, you go all the way back in Genesis chapter 4, God's going to tell us that this is how it's going to play out as a result of the curse. You remember, you remember reading about this, but Adam and Eve, they, they eat the forbidden fruit. Sin enters into the picture. God comes and he speaks to them. Hey, here's the curse of sin. Here's how it's going to play out in your relationships. Here's how it's going to play out in your world. And he says to the woman, he says, I'm going to greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you're going to give birth to children. But then he says this, he says, your desire is going to be for your husband, but he's going to rule over you. Your desire, your teshuka tech is the word that he uses right there. It's a word that literally means a very, very strong, all-consuming, sometimes even controlling kind of a desire. It's the same word used of sin trying to control Cain in Genesis chapter 4 when it says that, Sin was controlling Cain and compelled him to kill his brother Abel in that text over there. This is what he's saying. And he's saying, now that sin has come into the picture, you're going to have that kind of a desire for your husband. You're going to have this unbelievable, strong desire, whatever that specifically means. You're going to have this desire for him, and yet he's going to rule and have dominion over you. And none of it's, all of it's coming in the context of a curse, meaning none of this is how it's supposed to be. All of it's coming, God's saying, hey, now that sin is in the picture, this is how it's going to play out. Work isn't going to be easy for you men. It's going to be difficult. It's going to work against you. Your relationships, there's going to be a war between the genders that takes place, and you're not going to know this oneness easily. You're not going to know love easily. You're not going to know this side-by-side -side camaraderie and fellowship and this beautiful oneness here easily. That's not going to be neat. Not, like, that's been broken apart. There's going to be a dominion. There's going to be a warring. There's going to be a difficulty between men and women in church. We are here today talking about this today because that is how it's played out from the time in the garden. One of the most widely cited rabbinic sayings from the early Mishnaic period was a threefold prayer that said, praise be to God that he hasn't made me a Gentile. Praise be to God that he hasn't made me a woman. Praise be to God that he hasn't made me an ignoramus. Like, this is how women were viewed in the, from the early times. Genesis 20, Abraham hands over his wife to Abimelech like she's nothing. Like, this is what he's talking about in this text. Like, this is what he hands her over like she's nothing. Judges 19, a dad hands over his young daughter to an angry, lustful, and violent crowd. Why? He didn't want to give him the young man who was a guest in his home that night. Here, take my daughter instead. 
Even today, one in, four, one in three women have experienced some sort of domestic violence. One in four have experienced extreme forms of domestic violence. 93% of all domestic violence cases that are reported are reported by women. Praise be to God that Jesus came to undo everything sin destroyed. That in Christ, he screams at the top of his lungs and says, this isn't how we do it. That when Jesus comes on the scene and every time we hear scriptures and passages about submission or about husbands and wives or any of these things, it is always followed up by an admonition to the men that reminds them this is not how we do it in Christ. We do things a different way. This is what he's doing in verse 7. Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. Consideration is not the norm, especially in the first century. Especially long before that, there is no consideration for women back in that time. Literally, the Greek says, live with your wife according to knowledge. In other words, men, know your wife. Pay attention to her. Not the idea of her, not who she was when you first got married, not the box that you wanted, that you wanted her to live in, not the picture of the ideal, right? Not the godly Beyonce that you had on the poster on the wall at home or anything like that. Like, no, 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 no. Like, know her actually as she is, how she's wired, what she loves, how she thinks, what she's gifted by God to do her contribution to this world, what she brings to your marriage, how she brings you up, builds you up, comforts, helps, does life with you. Know her, live with her according to knowledge is what he says. He says, treat her with respect because respect was not normative in that time. What was normative was if she disrespected you, you shove her into submission. You, God says through Peter, treat her with respect, understanding she's the weaker partner here, meaning which is a reference to physical weakness and probably even social weakness too. We've already talked about some of the social inequities that were very, very common under Roman law. Men were expected to have affairs. Women did it, and they're thrown in prison. Like that was normative. A man was able to initiate a divorce. A woman was not able to get out under any circumstances whatsoever. Like, that's what the law prescribed. A woman's testimony wasn't allowed in a Roman court of law. That's what he's talking about right here. Some people want to say, well, it's an emotional weakness, too. Like, somehow, if you've got a greater sensitivity to the needs of other people, this mothering, nurturing kind of an instinct that a lot of women have, okay, that's somehow emotional weakness. And somehow, like, hey, a man who is emotionally reacting with anger and violence and all these different kinds of things, like, that's not weakness? Not talking about emotional weakness here by any stretch of the imagination. And you know how we know that? Because some of the things that we think are weak today, they're called godliness in Scripture. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, things like compassion, nurturing, care, listening. What are the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. What does he say here? Gentleness, gentleness. Gentleness. In other words, when the Holy Spirit's taking control of your life, men, this is the picture of what he wants you to be. Women, this is the picture of what he wants you to be. It's called godliness and the word of God. And he says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is gentleness, which is what he says there in verse 4. He's talking about the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. He is not talking about passivity. He is not saying, hey, wives, you just shut your mouth. Go sit in that corner over there and do your thing. Don't challenge me. Don't question who I am. Don't speak up. We don't need to continue in this debate or this argument or anything like that. He's not saying, you go sit over there and let me do my thing. He's talking about a work of the Holy Spirit, whereby he fills you with a quiet confidence around everything that is true and good and holy to the point that no matter the storm that's taking place out there, there is a quiet stillness deep inside your soul. And what Peter's going is, that is beautiful. That is beautiful, ladies. Men too, gentlemen, but he's specifically talking to ladies here and he's sitting there going, like, that is beautiful. When the Spirit takes, does a work inside of your life, gives you a quiet strength, this unbelievable confidence in his ability, the one who always judges justly, what he can do on your behalf when you can sit there and you can have a little bit more peace than what is normative in that particular point in time. He's saying that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. It is a thousand times more winsome than the wittiest comment you can make or the strongest retaliatory argument that you could possibly make in any given moment. And what Peter's saying here is, this is how that husband would be one. 
if that fool, if that husband, if that person that you're in relationship with, you are longing for them to be one, this is how they're going to be one. It's not by rising up and doing it in your own strength and doing all these different kinds of things. No, no, he says, this is how people will be one. And so he says, husbands, be considerate, treat your wives with honor and respect, and I love this, as heirs with you. Do not miss that, circle that in your text. As heirs with you, not beneath you. What's the language of the curse? They're going to rule and dominate over you. They're going to rule over you. Curse language is, I'm ruling over you. In Christ language is, heirs with you. This is what he's talking about. Honor and respect as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. And then look what he says next. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. In other words, like, this is an unbelievably big, big deal to God. Husbands, I, this is how serious he takes your ability to honor and respect and to live with your wife according to real knowledge. He says, I won't even hear your prayers if you can't get this right. Some of us are sitting there going, oh my gosh, that makes sense now. Because I prayed and I longed for so many things, and my gosh. Paul's going to say, husbands, love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. Don't ever be harsh with them. Why? Harsh is curse. It's not the design. Love is the design. Oneness is the design. Camaraderie, fellowship, with you kind of a relationship is the design in this thing. Harsh is the curse. Ephesians 5 is going to say, submit to one another. In other words, there is a mutual submission through which men and women operate throughout the world that is behind every single relationship in which we live. And then he continues in verse 22, and he repeats that then to wives. And he says this, he says, wives, submit to your own husbands. In other words, don't neglect the word. Don't abandon it when you get to the 21st century America, and it is the most offensive thing that you could possibly think of. Don't go only to the negativist strings. There's still something for you here in the middle of this word. He says, no, no, no. In the middle of all that difficulty and that nonsense and things like that, in the middle of that, he says, no, no, no. Still submit to your own husbands, he says right here. Don't toss it out. And here's why. Because he says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. In other words, husbands have been given an added responsibility. And here's what that is. It is an added responsibility to steward the relationship well. This does not mean that a wife does not have responsibility, that she does not have leadership, she does not have a voice, she doesn't have any of these other kinds of things. It does mean that there's an added responsibility that is given to a husband not to dictate, not to control, not to rule over, not to self-inflate, but to sacrificially lead with love and respect so that his wife and family would flourish. This is the picture of headship that's given to us in this text, which is what Peter's referencing also in this text. And so the picture that we're going to see of this whole thing is not just one person doing all the giving. It's not just one person doing all the submitting and the other person sitting on a throne or anything like that. The picture that he gives us is going to be two people giving fully of themselves to one another for their good and for his glory. This is the picture that he's going to give us. It's why he continues and he says, husbands, love your wives. Honor and respect them is what Peter says. And then Paul's going to say in Ephesians 5, he says, love your wives. Love them. Don't just think about love. Don't just feel an affection. Don't just say it one time on the day that you said, I do. Do the work of love every single day, giving of yourself. How? As Jesus loved the church when he gave himself up for her. In other words, he's the example not only of submission, but he's the example of how to love. He's the example of how to give deference, and he's the example of how to give honor and respect. He's the example of what headship looks like in any given home, not your boss, not your coach, not your favorite politician, not the actor or the character on TV that we look up to, not John Wayne, not Bruce Wayne, not Little Wayne, whatever Waynes we want to talk about or anything like that, not Chuck Norris, as close as that may be, uh, not your dad. The example that he's giving to us about how this plays out for you as a husband in your home is Jesus, the one who gave up his life, the one who demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ came and he died for us. This is the example in our home. It's Jesus in John 13 when he gets on his hands and his knees and he chooses to wash his disciples' feet. And then he says, go and do the exact same thing. You want to talk about leadership? Let's talk about this. Let, let, let's put this up at the leadership conferences that we go to. Let's talk about this. This isn't normative in the world today. 
I've never heard this in any kind of a leadership conference outside of the church Christian pastor ones and stuff that we go to. But this is not normative type of leadership that he's talking about here where you get down on your hands and your knees and you serve those for their good. It's Matthew 20 when he says the greatest among you will be a servant. And it's Jesus when he submits to the will of the Father. And he chooses to lay down his life for the long-term flourishing of his bride. Church, like that is the example. Men, that is the example. Husbands, that is the example that's been given to you. Church, where is the scandal in that picture of marriage? Where's the hardship? If the whole picture is embraced and the whole picture is pursued, where's the scandal when we're talking about Jesus overcoming sin's curse? Two people doing good and fully giving to one another. I can't tell you how many people I talk to all the time that are desperate for this kind of a marriage. It's a wife I talked to recently, this past week, who emailed me in, knowing what we were going to be talking about. And she said that in the context of her previous marriage, submission meant that she needed to stop questioning him when there was obviously an affair that was going on. And it's a massive misappropriation of money. You need to stop questioning my authority is how it got applied with them. Desperate for the whole picture of what God calls us to in a biblical marriage. It's the husband who is preparing for ministry and all of a sudden his wife goes ice cold. He comes and he says, Aaron, every time I tried to initiate any kind of dates, romance, prayer, fun, all I got was resistance. All I got was anger at home, a wall that was up, a disconnection that was taking place. So the husband I talked to, he said, every time I come home, I've, my home feels like a burden to me right now. Because when I walk in that door, all I feel is her disappointment and dissatisfaction with where we are in our lives today. It's the friend I've talked to and told you about many times who was told to submit to all kinds of horrific and painful marital acts with her husband while watching things that he was not supposed to be watching at that time. By the way, I hear that story a lot. The same woman who went to her elders, not at this church, asking for help. They told her that if she would just submit a little bit better, then he wouldn't be wanting those things in the first place. And what Peter's saying is that's the curse, y'all. That is not the newness of life in Christ. That is not the ideal which in Christ he is bringing us back to, this oneness, this wholeness, this love, this deferential giving of one to another, not just one person giving and another person taking, but two people giving fully of themselves for the good of the other. So hear Peter when he says, like, church, you want to see people want? Like, you want to see your husband want? You want to see your wife want? You want to see a watching world one, he says, it's right here. Wives, keep submitting to your own husbands. He says, not to sin, not to abuse, not to any of these things. But yeah, if leadership ain't great, don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. Don't abandon doing good as soon as it gets tough. You don't ignore him. You don't ice him out. You don't go passive aggressive, like leaving little things out there. And you're like, I hope he picks up. You should pick up on this, right? You don't go aggressive aggressive. Some of you are like, I don't need the passive stuff. Just like... I'm going to kill this fool. Like, it's like, no, you don't go aggressive, aggressive. You don't try to manipulate and control. I think that's a little of what he's talking about in verse 3, talking about don't adorn yourself with a beauty, knowing that, hey, like, he is nothing. Like, you can win him with your beauty. Like, you can do a lot of things to a dude if just with physical beauty. He says, no, rise up in the inner beauty of a quiet soul. He says this. Here's what it looks like, church. And trust yourself to the one who judges justly. You find yourself in a difficult situation, not an abuse of where you need rescue and safety, but you find yourself in a difficult situation, number one, and trust yourself to the one who always judges justly. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit, number two, to fill you with a quiet confidence and strength that is not as effective, as effective, um, as affected by what's happening out there around you. And I say as affected because you're always going to be affected by any difficulties that are out there. But God, would you fill me with a quiet confidence and would you fill me with a strength so that I can continue to walk with you, submitting to you always, no matter what's happening around me. Number three, that you would honorably speak your peace. You have not been called to sit in a corner. You have not been called to just, hey, you don't have a voice. You don't have a role to play. You don't have an, a, a, an essential role to play. 
an absolutely essential role to play in this marriage. You honorably speak your peace is what he's saying. Use your voice, but don't dishonor. Don't go into sin. Don't go into retaliation in the middle of it all. And then once you've done that, number four, you pray and you just ask God that your unbelieving husband would be one. Father, I'm letting go. And I'm trusting you to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I'm trusting that there is more power in me backing away at this moment once I've done everything that I can do. And there's more power in letting you step into this thing than anything I can conjure up and do myself. That you would pray and you would ask that he would be one. I think on the slide I put he, someone would be one. If that is in a context of a marriage where, hey, he's a believer too, just, hey, you're the one that's passionately pursuing him. He may not be there. You may step out of there. It may be a really difficult conversation. You're not really on the same page. And you're coming. You've said your peace. You step out. You say, okay, God, let someone here be one. And that someone could include me because I may not have all the wisdom in, in the world either, right? God, let me be one as well. I'm thinking about a wedding I got to officiate a few years back. It was a beautiful wedding. Older couple. And uh, we got together. I'm hearing their stories. And her testimony is one where she's known the Lord for the majority of her life. She's walked with the Lord very, very faithfully. They've known each other, been friends for a long time. And, and, uh, but she's the one that's walked with the Lord forever. And he gets to his turn and he says, Aaron, he goes, the reason that I'm a Christian today is because of her. He's like, I've known her for so many years. And I've just been amazed at what God has done in her life. I cannot believe the amount of joy, the amount of peace, the amount of humility that I've seen in her life. And he goes, I am a Christian now today. We did not start dating until that took place. But I saw Jesus living in her, and I didn't know what else to do except I needed this Jesus in my life. I'm telling you, church, like what he is talking about in this text, I'm, there is an incredible woo factor that he's talking about here that we don't give a whole lot of credibility to today. Unbelievable woo factor. I'm thinking about a friend a uh, friend's parents that I've known for about 30 years now, but she was the mom that when we were growing up, she would be the one that would always bring the kids to church. A dad wasn't there. He wasn't a believer. He was a great man from everything that we could understand, and we always enjoyed him. He was a really good guy, and um, he just they weren't on the same page about this, and so every single week, she was the one that would bring the kids to church. She was the one that would do the quiet time. She's the one that would disciple and train and do all the work and things like that, and yet he never, ever came to faith. I remember in high school, we were praying for him all the time. God, let him come to faith. Saw a Facebook post um, about two years ago, I think it was, something like that. I think it was shortly after their 50th anniversary, and the celebration was after 50 years of marriage, he finally submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ and came to faith. Unbelievable patience. Amen. Unbelievable patience and humility and submission and godliness to continue to just keep walking with Jesus no matter what. There is an unbelievable woo factor to what he is calling us to here. It is not easy. It is not easy. And here's the other thing. It doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. And I'm looking at you, and I know some of those stories too. And the encouragement that's here in this text is that in the middle of that place, he sees what you've been through. And here's what he says in 19, it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of suffering because they are conscious of God. All of your years, all of your years of faithfulness, all of your years of God, let him be one. Let him be one. Let him be one, God. All of the waiting, all of the difficulty, all of the suffering. He's looking at that and he's going, there's honor there. When no one else was honoring it, no one else saw it, Jesus saw it. And he sees those years. And he says, if no one else is giving you credit, know that there's a God in heaven who's giving you credit. And I see your pain and I call it honorable. Honorable. Well done, sister. Well done, my sister. The encouragement in this text is that it's not just one. There's so many different things to celebrate here. It's not just one person doing all the giving. He says to the husbands, be considerate, love, and respect your wife. Know who she really is. Women, you've got an obligation. You've got a responsibility. And husbands, you do too. Three things very specifically, it means that I value who she actually is. Not the ideal, not the picture, not the, 
not the where she was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, not any of these things, not who my mom was, not who any of these kinds of things are. I value who she actually is. It means that I pay attention, and it means that I listen to her, and it means that I want to know what she's thinking. It means I want to know what she's feeling, even if I have no idea what that even means. I'm confused. I don't know what that means. I'm going to read a book and try to figure it out, right? I'm going to go to the conference, and I'm going to, you know, whatever. But it means that I care. It means I value her as an essential part to my life. It means that I value what she has to say. It means I make space so that her voice is always going to be heard. Knowing my strength, I can suffocate easily. I could easily squash. I could easily shove. I could easily force my way in ungodly ways. That's where sin will often take us. And God says, no, I want to know your voice. It means I value all the things that God has given her to do. It means I look at her life and all of the unique gifts and abilities that God has given to her. All of her strengths, all of her abilities, all of her passions. Everything that's unique and beautiful about who she is. And if I take headship seriously, it means that I've got a responsibility to pay attention to these different things and to love and serve and honor and respect in such a way that sees her flourish. That we get to the end of our days Man, we're like, that was awesome. Killed it. Keep writing. Keep going. Keep serving. Keep doing your thing. Thinking of Jerry and Priscilla Shire. Jerry Shire is married to Priscilla Shire. If you don't know who Priscilla is, she's one of the most impressive human beings I can think of today. Unbelievable evangelist. Can preach the socks off of anything. Preacher, teacher, evangelist, author, actress, mother, wife, mother of three boys. Her husband, Jerry, talks about the day that he felt convicted by God to leave his high-level position with Hilton so that he could basically work for her nonprofit and empower her, strengthen her to go and to preach the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world. He says, I was wrestling with what it looked like for me to love, honor, and serve and respect my wife, who I know has a unique gift and calling to do things in serving the Lord that are not normal. And he goes, the Lord just kept showing me that his love compelled him to lay, lay down his life for the sake of his bride. And so he goes, I know it's not normal to give up a great job and career, but I firmly believe that the best way for us to give glory to God in our marriage was for me to see how she was uniquely wired and set her free to go and do everything that God has called her to do. It's the picture that he's given to us here, that we would live with one another according to knowledge. I see you, wife. And this may be a season where kids are your thing and your calling is, hey, I need to be home. I need to be present for this. However long that may be, if that's where you are, then I want to be there with you. I want to support you. I want to come around you as a husband. And I want to do whatever it takes to make sure that that's where you are. And if you're out of that time or that's not where you are, that it's your work or your calling over here, you've got a gift of writing and preaching and teaching and all these different kinds of things, go and do it. If school's in the season, go and do it. I want to support you. I see these things. I honor what God is doing in your life. And I take seriously this responsibility that has been given to me to see you flourish. It's not a call to submission. It's not a, I'll take that back. It's not a call to suppression. It is not a call to anything like that. It is a call to deference. That two people will be one. That God will be praised and glorified in the end. The practice this week is that you would go out and that you may take a little time to prayerfully consider what it looks like. I was talking with Kristen this past week and I think she had a great recommendation. She just said, you know, this is going to look very different in most marriages. Being married to Priscilla Shire is very different than being married to somebody else or whoever you may be. And uh, what it looks like to love and respect in this context is going to be very difficult. Nevertheless, I think the admonition here this week is that you would do some work prayerfully and say, God, am I actually submitting anywhere in my marriage? Is there anywhere that I can look at and I can say, no, 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 this is what honor and respect actually looks like with my wife. And that you would do some work and that you would have some things that you can write down. And maybe if you can't get there, that maybe you would have a conversation this week uh, our counselor one time said it's a state of the marriage address where you sit there and you, you talk and you ask the tough question and you say, babe, do you see honor and respect in me? When was the last time that you saw it? And oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. 
Do you see submission anywhere in me? Because I long for God to come and have his way in me so that he can have his way in us so that a watching world would be one. And that's the hope, church. That's the hope. Be encouraged, be encouraged. If you're in the middle of it, be encouraged. Jesus sees you and he honors you. If you're on the back end of it, be encouraged knowing that he sees you and he calls it honorable. He calls it honorable. Father, we love you, God. We praise you, Lord, we rejoice in you. That you show us how it's done. We ask that your spirit would do a work in all of us, men and women, to where your way would really win out. God, that love would be the example. God, that you would be praised. That a watching world would be won. For the wife in the difficult situation, I pray that she would be safe, that she would know that there's a church that wants to come around and support and help save and rescue as an extension of your character. But also, God, if that's not where it is, Father, I pray that they would be encouraged and strengthened. For the husband, maybe, that may just be not walking according to knowledge, God, I pray that they would come back to you. For the ones that are doing it well, God, cheer them on. Breathe life into them, Lord Jesus. We want marriages reconciled, healing all around. God, be pleased, be glorified. We love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.